Chapter 12 of The Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 12 A Black Scoundrel. When Jane Clayton regained consciousness, she saw Anderson standing over her, holding the baby in his arms. As her eyes rested upon them, an expression of misery and horror overspread her countenance. "'What is the matter?' he asked. "'You bain sick?' "'Where is my baby?' she cried, ignoring his questions. Anderson held out the chubby infant, but she shook her head. "'It is not mine,' she said. "'You knew that it was not mine. You are a devil like the Russian.' Anderson's blue eyes stretched in surprise. "'Not yours,' he exclaimed. "'You told me the kid aboard the Kincaid bain your kid.' "'Not this one,' replied Jane dully. "'The other. Where is the other? There must have been two. I did not know about this one.' "'There wasn't no other kid. I tank this being yours. I am very sorry.' Anderson fidgeted about, standing first on one foot and then upon the other. It was perfectly evident to Jane that he was honest in his protestations of ignorance of the true identity of the child. Presently the baby commenced to crow and bounce up and down in the Swede's arms and at the same time leaning forward with little hands outreaching toward the young woman. She could not withstand the appeal, and with a low cry she sprang to her feet and gathered the baby to her breast. For a few minutes she wept silently, her face buried in the baby's soiled little dress. The first shock of disappointment that the tiny thing had not been her beloved Jack was giving away to a great hope that after all some miracle had occurred to snatch her baby from Rokoff's hands at the last instant before the Kincaid sailed from England. Then, too, there was the mute appeal of this wee waif alone and unloved in the midst of the horrors of the savage jungle. It was this thought, more than any other, that had sent her mother's heart out to the innocent babe, while still she suffered from disappointment that she had been deceived in its identity. "'Have you no idea whose child this is?' she asked Anderson. The man shook his head. "'Not now,' he said. "'If he ain't bang your kid, I don't know whose kid he bang. Rokoff said it was yours. I tank he tank so, too.' What can we do with it now? I can't go back to the Kincaid. Rokoff would have me shot, but you can go back. I take you to the sea, and then some of these black men, they take you to the ship, eh? No, no, cried Jane, not for the world. I would rather die than fall into the hands of that man again. No, let us go on and take this poor creature with us. If God is willing, we shall be saved in one way or another. So they again took up their flight through the wilderness, taking with them a half-dozen of the masalas to carry provisions, and the tents that Anderson had smuggled aboard the small boat in preparation for the attempted escape. The days and nights of torture that the young woman suffered were so merged into one long, unbroken nightmare of hideousness that she soon lost all track of time. Whether they had been wandering for days or years she could not tell. The one bright spot in that eternity of fear and suffering was a little child whose tiny hands had long since fastened their softly groping fingers firmly about her heart. In a way, the little thing took the place and filled the aching void that the theft of her own baby had left. It could never be the same, of course, but yet, day by day, she found her mother love enveloping the waif more closely, until sometimes she sat with closed eyes lost in a sweet imagining that the little bundle of humanity at her breast was truly her own. For some time their progress inland was extremely slow. Word came to them from time to time through natives passing from the coast on hunting excursions that Rokoff had not yet guessed the direction of their flight. This, and the desire to make the journey as light as possible for the gently bred woman, kept Anderson to a slow advance of short and easy marches with many rests. The Swede insisted upon carrying the child while they traveled, and in countless other ways did what he could to help Jane Clayton conserve her strength. He had been terribly chagrined on discovering the mistake he had made in the identity of the baby, but once the young woman became convinced that his motives were truly chivalrous, she would not permit him any longer to upbraid himself for the error that he could not by any means have avoided. At the close of each day's march, Anderson saw to the erection of a comfortable shelter for Jane and the child. Her tent was always pitched in the most favorable location. The thorn boma around it was the strongest and most impregnable that the Mosula could construct. Her food was the best that their limited stores and the rifle of the Swede could provide. But the thing that touched her heart the closest was the gentle consideration and courtesy which the man always accorded her. That such nobility of character could lie beneath so repulsive an exterior never ceased to be a source of wonder and amazement to her, until at last the innate chivalry of the man, 
and his unfailing kindness and sympathy transformed his appearance in so far as Jane was concerned, until she saw only the sweetness of his character mirrored in his countenance. They had commenced to make a little better progress when word reached them that Rokoff was but a few marches behind them, and that he had at last discovered the direction of their flight. It was then that Anderson took to the river, purchasing a canoe from a chief whose village lay a short distance from the Ungambi upon the bank of a tributary. Thereafter the little party of fugitives fled up the broad Ungambi, and so rapid had their flight become that they no longer received word of their pursuers. At the end of canoe navigation upon the river they abandoned their canoe and took to the jungle. Here progress became at once arduous, slow, and dangerous. The second day after leaving the Ugambi, the baby fell ill with fever. Anderson knew what the outcome must be, but he had not the heart to tell Jane Clayton the truth, for he had seen that the young woman had come to love the child almost as passionately as though it had been her own flesh and blood. As the baby's condition precluded farther advance, Anderson withdrew a little from the main trail he had been following and built a camp in a natural clearing on the bank of a little river. Here Jane devoted her every moment to caring for the tiny sufferer, as though her sorrow and anxiety were not all that she could bear, a further blow came with the sudden announcement of one of the Masula porters, who had been foraging in the jungle adjacent that Rokoff and his party were camped quite close to them, and were evidently upon their trail to this little nook, which all had thought so excellent a hiding place. This information could mean but one thing, and that they must break camp and fly onward regardless of the baby's condition. Jane Clayton knew the traits of the Russian well enough to be positive that he would separate her from the child the moment that he recaptured them, and she knew that separation would mean the immediate death of the baby. As they stumbled forward through the tangled vegetation along an old and almost overgrown game trail, the Masula porters deserted them one by one. The men had been staunch enough in their devotion and loyalty as long as they were in no danger of being overtaken by the Russian and his party. They had heard, however, so much of the atrocious disposition of Rokoff that they had grown to hold him in mortal terror, and now that they knew he was close upon them, their timid hearts would fortify them no longer, and as quickly as possible they deserted the three whites. Yet on and on went Anderson and the girl. The Swede went ahead, to hew a way through the brush where the path was entirely overgrown, so that on this march it was necessary that the young woman carry the child. All day they marched. Late in the afternoon they realized that they had failed. Close behind them they heard the noise of a large safari advancing along the trail, which they had cleared for their pursuers. When it became quite evident that they must be overtaken in a short time, Anderson hid Jane behind a large tree, covering her and the child with brush. "'There is a village about a mile further on,' he said to her. "'The Masula told me its location before they deserted us. "'I try to lead the Russian off your trail. "'Then you go on to the village. "'I think the chief been friendly to white men. "'The Masula tell me he had been. "'Anyhow, that was all we can do. "'After a while, you get chief to take you down "'by the Masula village to the sea again, "'and after a while, a ship is sure to pit "'into the mouth of the Ungambi. "'Then you be all right. "'Good-bye and good luck to you, lady.' "'But where are you going, Sven?' asked Jane. "'Why can't you hide here and go back to the sea with me?' "'I gotta tell the Russian you bain dead, "'so that he don't look for you no more,' and Anderson grinned. "'Why can't you join me then after you have told him that?' insisted the girl. Anderson shook his head. "'I don't think I join anybody any more after I tell the Russian you bain dead,' he said. "'You don't mean that you think he will kill you?' asked Jane." And yet in her heart she knew that that was exactly what the great scoundrel would do in revenge for his having been thwarted by the Swede. Anderson did not reply, other than to warn her to silence and point toward the path along which they had just come. "'I don't care,' whispered Jane Clayton. "'I shall not let you die to save me if I can prevent it in any way. Give me your revolver. I can use that, and together we may be able to hold them off until we can find some means of escape.' "'It won't work, lady,' replied Anderson." They would only get us both, and then I couldn't do you no good at all. Think of the kid, lady, and what it would be for you both to fall into Rokoff's hands again. For his sake, you must do what I say. Here, take my rifle and ammunition. You may need them. He shoved the gun and bandolier into the shelter beside Jane. Then he was gone. She watched him as he returned along the path to meet the oncoming safari of the Russian. Soon a turn in the trail hid him from view. Her first impulse was to follow. With the rifle, she might be of assistance to him, and further, she could not bear the terrible thought of being left alone at the mercy of the fearful jungle without a single friend to aid her. She started to crawl from her shelter with the intention of running after Anderson as fast as she could. 
As she drew the baby close to her, she glanced down into its little face. How red it was! How unnatural the little thing looked! She raised the cheek to hers. It was fiery hot with fever. With a little gasp of terror, Jane Clayton rose to her feet in the jungle path. The rifle and bandolier lay forgotten in the shelter beside her. Anderson was forgotten, and Rokoff, and her great peril. All that rioted through her fear-mad brain was the fearful fact that this little helpless child was stricken with a terrible jungle fever, and that she was helpless to do aught to allay its sufferings, sufferings that were sure to come during ensuing intervals of partial consciousness. Her one thought was to find someone who could help her, some woman who had had children of her own, and with the thought came recollection of the friendly village of which Anderson had spoken. If she could but reach it, in time. There was no time to be lost. Like a startled antelope, she turned and fled up the trail in the direction Anderson had indicated. From far behind came the sudden shouting of men, the sound of shots, and then silence. She knew that Anderson had met the Russian. A half hour later she stumbled, exhausted into a little thatched village. Instantly she was surrounded by men, women, and children. Eager, curious, excited natives plied her with a hundred questions, no one of which she could understand or answer. All that she could do was point tearfully at the baby, now wailing piteously in her arms, and repeat over and over, Fever! 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 The blacks did not understand her words, but they saw the cause of her trouble. And soon a young woman had pulled her into a hut, and with several others was doing her poor best to quiet the child and allay its agony. The witch-doctor came in and built a little fire before the infant, upon which he boiled some strange concoction in a small earthen pot making weird passes above it and mumbling strange, monotonous chants. Presently he dipped the zebra's tail into the brew, and with further mutterings and incantations sprinkled a few drops of the liquid over the baby's face. After he had gone, the women sat about and moaned and wailed until Jane thought that she should go mad. But, knowing that they were doing it all out of the kindness of their hearts, she endured the frightful waking nightmare of those awful hours in dumb and patient suffering. It must have been well toward midnight that she became conscious of a sudden commotion in the village. She heard the voices of the natives raised in controversy, but she could not understand the words. Presently she heard footsteps approaching the hut in which she squatted before a bright fire, with the baby on her lap. The little thing lay very still now, its lids half raised, showed the pupils horribly upturned. Jane Clayton looked into the little face with fear-haunted eyes. It was not her baby, not her flesh and blood. But how close, how dear the tiny, helpless thing had become to her. Her heart, bereft of its own, had gone out to this poor little nameless waif, and lavished upon it all the love that had been denied her during the long, bitter weeks of her captivity aboard the Kincaid. She saw that the end was near, and though she was terrified at contemplation of her loss, still she hoped that it would come quickly now, and in the suffering of the little victim. The footsteps she had heard without the hut now halted before the door. There was a whispered colloquy and a moment later Maganwazam, chief of the tribe, entered. She had seen but little of him, as the women had taken her in hand almost as soon as she entered the village. Maganwazam, she now saw, was an evil-appearing savage, with every mark of brutal degeneracy writ large upon his bestial countenance. To Jane Clayton he looked more gorilla than human. He tried to converse with her, but without success, and finally he called to someone without. In answer to his summons another negro entered, a man of a very different appearance from Maganwazam, so different, in fact, that Jane Clayton immediately decided that he was of another tribe. The man acted as interpreter, and almost from the first question that Maganwazam put to her, Jane felt an intuitive conviction that the savage was attempting to draw information from her for some ulterior motive. She thought it strange that the fellow should so suddenly have become interested in her plans, and especially in her intended destination when her journey had been interrupted at his village. Seeing no reason for withholding the information, she told him the truth. But when he asked if she expected to meet her husband at the end of the trip, she shook her head negatively. Then he told her the purpose of his visit, talking through the interpreter. I have just learned, he said, from some men who live by the side of the great water, that your husband followed you up the Ungambi for several marches, when he was at last set upon by natives and killed. Therefore I have told you this, that you might not waste your time in a long journey if you expected to meet your husband at the end of it, but instead could turn and retrace your steps to the coast. Jane thanked Maganwazam for his kindness, though her heart was numb with suffering at this new blow. She who had suffered so much was at last beyond reach of the keenest of misery's pangs. 
for her senses were numbed and calloused. With bowed head she sat staring with unseen eyes upon the face of the baby in her lap. Maganwazam had left the hut. Some time later she heard a noise at the entrance. Another had entered. One of the women, sitting opposite her, threw a faggot upon the dying embers of the fire between them. With a sudden flare it burst into renewed flame, lighting up the hut's interior as though by magic. The flame disclosed to Jane Clayton's horrified gaze that the baby was quite dead. How long it had been so, she could not guess. A choking lump rose to her throat, her head dropped in silent misery upon the little bundle that she had caught suddenly to her breast. For a moment the silence of the hut was unbroken. Then the native woman broke into a hideous wail. A man coughed close before Jane Clayton and spoke her name. With a start she raised her eyes to look into the sardonic countenance of Nicholas Rokoff. End of chapter 12